Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm the, it seems, uh, except a few of us here, I'm not a nutritionist. I must declare that as a statement before here. I'm a food scientist. As a matter of fact, I'm a material scientist interested in engineering structure and functionality and then uh, tagging along uh, with uh, the trends that the experts in the areas uh, teach us from time to time to see if we can engineer things in, the, in order to address both functionality and as well structure. So. Today I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of fats and oils in general, the ways of modifying fats and oils, and I promise to touch upon interserification as well. Don't be afraid. So um, first of all, uh, let's start with some platitudes. Uh, fats and oils are important to health because they're a very high source of energy, so that's good. Not like four calories per gram, but uh, nine, you get a bang for your buck. And also, they're carriers of all soluble vitamins, let's not forget that, and other valuable micronutrients, and as well contain essential and maybe conditionally essential fatty acids which are required for health. So they're important nutrients. Now, that's the importance to nutrition and health, but what about fats and oils for the food industry? Well, anybody who likes eating would agree with me that they add flavor. They add lubricity, texture to foods, and contribute to the feeling of satiety upon consumption, an, an aspect that is often overseen. Um, after extraction and refining of a fat and oil, they can be processed into products such as margarine, shortening, salad, and frying oil. So per se, the extracted fat and oil is not in a 100% useful format. It must be processed. Now, processed fats and oils are important functional ingredients in foods. So some of the functionality that it, it's something very difficult to define, but if you wanted to write it down on a list, some of these functionalities, macroscopic physical properties which address some sort of use by humans is spreadability. I mean, think about um, a material with a yield stress, which now uh, above that yield stress begins flowing like a fluid and covers the surface of your toast and it's creamy. That can be explained with the word spreadability. Laminating ability. Anybody who loves croissants like myself uh, would know that you know 200 layers of dough are separated by micron-sized lamella of fat, which must withstand pressures upwards of 10 to the 5, 10 to the 6 pascals, and then upon baking must immobilize steam explosions in between lines and go puff, puff pastry. We like croissants. So it must be doing that. And also must shorten, shorten, turn your bread into a cookie, prevent the growth of gluten strands so that you get a nice soft cookie and not a hard puck that can be stepped upon with your shoes. So there's a lot of functionality in fats. And of course, my favorite always is mechanical strength. A bar of chocolate would not be a bar of chocolate without the extra fat put into it. Now, we eat a lot of fat. Um, let's go to 2011 here, palm oil. 50 million metric tons of palm oil are consumed. Number two, 42 million metric tons of soybean oil. If you wonder who's the number three, that's um, rapeseed oil, canola oil type thing. That's about 20 million metric tons. That's a lot of fat. And fourth down here, sunflower seed oil. So palm oil, soybean oil dominate the, the, the world market. How much shortening does do bakeries consume? A medium-sized baker in Toronto, a million kilos a year. A company, a very large processor of fats and oils from Singapore, uh, has a global market of a billion kilos of shortening. That's one manufacturer. North American figures are absurd. You can, uh, probably the ADN guys know it, but nobody wants to give you this information. But one to two billion pounds, it may be kilos, but at that point, who cares? One to two billion pounds of shortening consumed in North America yearly. That's the number. So they become a little absurd. Now, fats and oils, think of these as different inputs into your processing operation. And uh, fats and oils from corn to palm to palm sterin to canola have different fatty acid compositions that are very, very unique. If we go to palm oil, the most famous one, for example, it's 44% palmitic acid, 39% oleic acid. Now, if you go to something like soybean, on the other hand, it's 53% linoleic acid, 18-2, with very low levels of saturates on the other hand. 
Um, so depending on what you want to do, these are the inputs that come to be processed. Now we have palm, I'll talk to you about palm olein, which is a liquid version of palm oil, uh, uh, isolated by fractionation. Palm stearin, which is a hard version, a higher melting version of it, isolated from the same fractionation process. So different inputs have different fatty acid compositions, and fatty acid compositions come from a traditional GLC analysis. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Animal fats, on the other hand, have different compositions. Butter has a very high amount of saturated fatty acids with shorter chains included in there. And, uh, for example, beef tallow, the beef fat, has a very high content of 16 and 18. Well, not that high. And a very high content of oleic acid. So all I'm trying to get to this point is that this is what's in the cupboard of the food scientists in order to achieve a certain functionality. You have all these fats with naturally occurring fatty acid composition. Now, as a, as a consequence of the molecular composition of the material, you thus have fats with different melting points. Everything from 48 degrees Celsius down to 26 Celsius for coconut oil. So you can imagine that this melting point plays importantly into the functionality of fats. For example, palm oil has a melting point of almost 40 degrees. We're talking about the clear point now when it's completely molten. Coconut oil, 26. Cocoa butter, 29. There's a more of a story there depending on how you temper the crystal. And as well, you have this solid fat content as a function of temperature profile. So what, how, many, how, how much crystalline material is present in your fat at different temperatures? Now, melting points, which are a consequence of your fatty acid composition and triglyceride structure, as well as this solid fat content versus temperature profile. And please, allow me to put this figure up, because in the area of fats and oils, for good or for bad, when you talk about functionality, the second question that a food scientist or a food company will ask you is, show me the SFC temperature profile. Most of the functionality of fats and oils is given by graphs like this. I don't agree with that 100%, but industry, food science, everybody relies on this pattern of SFC versus temperature profile. Notice how all these different fats can go from an all-purpose shortening to a pie shortening to a cake shortening, and a lot of importance is placed on the way that that looks. How many solids at different temperature define functionality because they would be directly related to the hardness of the material, to the plasticity of the material, and to eventually the, the ultimate melting point of the material. Uh, this defines a little bit the ratio, not defines completely, the ratio between solid and liquid fat present in the material, which is directly, indirectly related to functionality does not take into consideration crystal sizes, doesn't take into consideration interactions between crystals and many other things. However, this is the tool used by the fats and oil industry to define functionality. Um, there's another issue with functionality, which uh, has to do with the type of crystals that are present. I'm not going to lecture you about polymorphism today, but for example, uh, a, a, a fat crystal can have at the same, with the same chemical composition can have different types of solid state structure. It's defined as beta, beta prime, and alpha. It's a long story, maybe for another day. But for example, the snap, the color, uh, sorry, the, the surface reflection, and the melting properties of good quality chocolate are given by cocoa butter being in this beta form. If you don't have it in the beta form, your chocolate is no good. It will either bloom or it will not taste right. While milk fat, the plasticity, the way it spreads on, on, on toast and all those good things are given by the presence of these beta prime crystals. Most margarines and shortenings people will tell you they have to be in the beta prime form and all good confectionery fats should probably, based on cocoa butter, should be in the beta form. So this is what's in the mind of the food scientists going around when they talk about functionality. Is it in the alpha? It's, well, nobody wants alpha, but beta prime or beta and what is the SFC temperature profile? Now, having talked about fatty acid composition being the molecular uh, basis of functionality, in reality, when you see something like palm oil and somebody gives you a fatty acid analysis, you know, you know what mass percent there is of the different fatty acids, that is only telling you a part of the story. And the reality of this very 
simple and innocuous looking fatty acid composition is this. And the reality is that with this combination of fatty acids, you can have a very wide variety of triglycerides present. Uh, P stands for palmitic, M for meristic, P for palmitic. Look at, look at the, the wealth of triglycerides that are present based on this fatty acid composition. These two tables give you exactly the same characterization of the system, but obviously a fatty acid composition is incomplete. We should really move towards triglyceride uh, composition. For example, an interstereified fat, as we will get to it, you, you provide me with a fatty acid composition of an interstereified fat, you've given me nothing. Because non-interstereified and interstereified fats have exactly the same fatty acid composition, but completely different triglyceride compositions. And I wonder whether regulations, at least in Canada, which do not require declaration of the fact that a fat has been interstereified at all, you do not have to declare, comes from the fact that Obviously, the fats are identical from a fatty acid composition point of view. Therefore, you have not affected functional structure. That's partially correct. If you did this kind of analysis, you would have been very surprised. You have affected molecular structure tremendously. If you do this kind of analysis, of course, they're identical. So what are some of the fats and oils modification methods? Uh, the fact that different functionalities uh, require specific compositions that are usually not found in native fats and oils. Um, so we have to modify the fats to achieve these, um, to achieve these either for oxidative stability or, uh, for example, temperature and solid fat content melting profiles. Some of the uh, modification methods used by the food industry include blending, fractionation, hydrogenation, intersterification, which can be chemical and zymatic. And I would like to propose that we stop calling these things genetically modified organism and start calling them genetically improved organism. And if you want to be very topical today, maybe you can call them G.I. Joes. G.I. <laughs> New movie coming out. So what about blending? Now, the idea is that you saw all those, those inputs that I had there, all those different fats and oils. You can mix these together to achieve a certain SFC temperature profile. Now we're talking about the same thing, right? So you combine them in order to get a specific composition, consistency, or stability. You can add in there partially or fully hydrogenated oils, interstereified oils and fats, which are we, we're discussing today, or fractions from winterized or fractionated oils. There's no end to this. Now, fractionation very quickly is very important, very widely used. You can dissolve a fat in a solvent, let's say something very friendly like acetone, and then um, cool it down and fractionate it into high melting, middle melting, low melting, whatever melting you want, fractions. Or you can do it dry without the use of any solvent, dry or solvent. Most fractionation of palm oil in, in Malaysia these days is uh, the dry type, which is good, no organic solvents. So you get them into different fractions, but you could use it also to remove undesirable minor components, such as waxes. Uh, sunflower oil is full of waxes, right? Um, and winterization to make a salad oil, you put it in the fridge, things precipitate out, you can use it as a salad oil, otherwise you get your salad oil with chunks of fat. <coughs> the most famous example of fractionation in palm oil, you can get palm oil with an iodine value of 52. Think about it this way, a low iodine value is fully hydrogenated like 4, uh, soybean oil is 110, super unsaturated, Keep that as a reference. Somewhere in the middle is palm oil. You can get the famous stearin you probably have used. You cool it down. The stearin precipitates. The oiling is left above. Now, uh, here are the different products that are made with the stearin. With, uh, then you fractionate the stearin again, or you fractionate the oiling again, and you get all these intermediate things like palm oil, mid-fraction, mid-oiling, super oiling, top oiling. You just keep on fractionating and fractionating and fractionating until you get something that is very liquidy on this side or extremely hard on this side. So again, more inputs of uh, the palm oil that can go in there. Of course, the other famous example of uh, modification of fats and oils is that of hydrogenation. You take your naturally containing vegetable oils, you put them over nickel, you heat them up, you agitate them, you pump some hydrogen at 60 PSIG, and you transform them into a transform before fully hydrogenating them these fatty acids, I mean, fats containing trans fatty acids have excellent functionality, have always had excellent functionality. They form beta prime crystals. Their SFC temperature profile is A1. 
they're good for using, and they're very stable during deep frying as well. Uh, however, Dr. Mensing has shown us that we probably shouldn't be consuming many of these things before. But genetic improvement, very, very big area these days. Uh, you, can, you can genetically modify plants and microorganisms to produce oils with specific compositions. You can have them high saturated, high monounsaturated, low polyunsaturated. Um, these genetically improved oils can be used, again, as inputs in the formulation of shorting, margarine, and, and, and frying oils. An exciting example are microalgal oils coming full strength. Companies like Solazyme out of, uh, out of San Francisco now can now produce any composition you want. Any. It doesn't matter. You can throw away that whole bag of, of modification methods. They can do it with microalgae. What are these genetically improved vegetable oils? You may have seen them around as inputs. New Sun is high oleic sunflower oil with low levels of linolenic and some reduced level of 18.2. You can have high oleic, high steric sunflower oil, Nutrisun. Notice how they've reduced 18.2 and it's mostly oleic with some saturated uh, 18.0. I think that these people followed much of your work on saturated fats with 18.0 and, and, uh, and went on a huge genetic modification trip uh, in order to, well, to at least be in line with those nutritional recommendations. High oleic, high palmitic sunflower oil, high oleic canola oils, low linolenic soil, all of these are genetically improved either by breeding or direct genetic intervention. So what about intersterification? Intersterification now, it's yet another tool. I just wanted to put it into perspective because intersterification is not independent from your inputs and it's not independent from all the other techniques that are out there okay so it's a chemical reaction that induces the rearrangement of fatty acids within and between triacylglycerols now in the food industry intersterification can be carried out using a catalyst sodium methoxide i'll show you in a second or an enzyme an enzymatic intersterification both of them are the same those of you who study chemistry it's just catalysis now Chemical intersterification is a random modification tool, while enzymatic intersterification can be random or region-specific. Now, very surprised to be discussing intersterification in 2012, because it has been used since the late 40s to modify the functionality of lard. If you go to the Journal of American Alchemist Society, 1951, correct me if I'm not wrong, Herr, W-H-O-E-R-R, uh, -R, was modifying the crystal structure of lard by intersterifying it and therefore giving it that, remember, functionality that we talked about of the beta prime crystals. Big paper in 1951. That was before I was, uh, I was around. Um, so to induce beta prime tendencies, and it's used successfully to make products as the cell margarine. In Canada, 25% of the margarine is, uh, uh, sort of market is dominated by the cell. The cell is an intersterified palm fraction vegetable oil product, chemically intersterified. 25% of the Canadian market is the cell. They have that much, and it's an intersterified product. It has been an intersterified product for decades. Now, and let's not forget that the whole area of enzymatic modification of lipids was the famous patent, again, by Unilever, by McRae, if you remember that one, 1981. So that was the hot area of enzymatic modification. Uh, just go back and see McCray's paper. So it's, it's interesting that we're discussing, but nobody ever discussed the nutritional implications of all of this, but it has been around for now over 60 years. So a little bit of chemistry. You have uh, two fatty acids, uh, well, sorry, three fatty acids, A, B, and C, um, and you, let's say, carry out an intersterification between these two. Don't try to look at all the A's and B's, but look at look at the huge number of A and B's and C's containing um, triglycerides that you create out of the chemical, random chemical intersterification of two particular triglycerides. So you create a plethora of different triglycerides when you intersterify two seemingly simple triglycerides. A, B, and C stand for different fatty acids. It really does not matter what you have. So look at what you create. Now, if you do an enzymatic intersterification by an enzyme, uh, let's say a mucormehi lipase, right, so mucormehi or candida antarctica or something like that, you have the possibility of using a 1,3 specific lipase and look, you get very, very um, less 
number of triglycerides due to this. Why? Because you're only affecting positions one and positions three of the triglyceride molecule. So you do get intermediate triglycerides with properties that are half of this and half of this of the original triglyceride, but you do not have this kind of situation like before where you create these enormous, all the possible isomers predicted um, as if it was a random distribution of fatty acids in three positions, three fatty acids in three positions, you have all of them present there. Now, enzymes are not used to do this transesterification between two triglycerides. You can actually have hydrolysis where it splits the ester bond. You can actually take uh, a diglyceride or a partial glyceride and put a uh, uh, you can esterify onto the onto the um, onto the triglyceride molecule uh, an acid. You can esterify a alcohol. You can randomize fatty acids between two different triglyceride molecules, and you can even play around with uh, am amines in there. So you can add a fatty acid and incorporate it into the fat. You can add an alcohol and interchange fatty acids between that alcohol and the triglyceride. And as well, you can just randomize two different triglycerides. Different lipases are used in different applications. Some of the most famous ones are mucormehi enzymes from Novozyme. They have been working on this for a very, very long time. One, three specific lipase. Uh, Candida antarctica is another, or Candida rugosa. It has also been used in uh, enzymatic synthesis as well. So what about comparing the two intersterification methods? Uh, the chemical intersterification method, which is a chemical catalyst, is relatively low processing cost in a batch reactor. Enzymatic intersterification is a higher cost process. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can use a continuous plug flow reactor for that. You have to control conditions and you have the cost of light base. Uh, <clears throat> chemical intersterification can lead to high processing loss because it's carried out in a basic environment. You make soap. So in an enzymatic, you get less of a loss. Uh, sometimes you have low oxidative stability in the chemical interstrified product because you destroy the, the tocopherols and no change in oxidative stability. So these are extra things uh, besides composition in there. Now, there's high level of reaction byproducts, the monoglycerides, diglycerides, glycerol. Well, this one here, I'm qualifying that. You can have some diglycerides left over. In any enzymatically modified product, you will get 2 to 3% diglycerides in there. It doesn't matter how you clean it up the diglycerides will remain. So maybe that affects, careful with your experiments, <laughs> maybe it's the 4% diglyceride that is having the effect. Now, you may have flavor reversion problems in there. Um, you may not have in, in the enzymatic case because it's carried out at physiological temperatures and pressures. Uh, the other one, you have to heat it up to 60, 70, 80 degrees in a highly basic environment with sodium methoxide that could be affecting a lot of things. That's a very strong base. Chemical intersterification is cheap, and you can do it very reproducibly. Enzymatic inter intersterification is a much more complex process. However, our friends at, well, Unilever a long time ago, and the people at ADM know how to do it these days. But it took a long time to scale up. I'm talking 20 years to scale up and to produce efficiently. So here you have your batch reactor, and here you have an enzymatic four sort of packed beds of lipase. That would be the, the size of a, a human being. Uh, just to give you an idea, one is a big tank. That's how the cell is being made still, and uh, in uh, in Toronto at least, Lipton's, and uh, this is the enzymatic intersterification thing. So I told you that the chemical uh, intersterification usually relies on the addition of 0.3 percent of sodium methoxide, CH3ONA, uh, highly reactive and basic. It starts the reaction, and then the reaction takes. Then you have to stop it with some acidic water. You have to wash it with dilute base a few times, and then you put put it on top of some bleaching clay, and you're done with it. While uh, the nice thing about enzymatic is you add your enzyme, you basically shake it around or pass it through a reactor, and then you just filter away the enzyme, and you're done. So that it's a little bit less onerous to run. An example now that we are equipped with... Um, with all this knowledge, we know about fully hydrogenated canola oil. I get I bet, I bet you our American friends are happy to be able to use fully hydrogenated stocks again with very minimal amount of trans fatty acids. And you mix it with a high oleic sunflower oil, either a GI Joe one or uh, one that you get from traditional breeding. And notice the inputs here. 
fully hydrogenated uh, canola oil rich in stearic acid, which alleged at the time anyways when this was very popular, neutral to cardiovascular health issues, and um, high oleic oils are predominantly oleic acid. So we're adding a wax to a liquid oil because fully hydrogenated stocks look, feel like your wax are using in your bathroom on special events. And so here you have your wax and here you have your oil. You use sodium ethoxide or lipases and look at all the intermediate triglycerides that you create. With here, I'm showing a random distribution of these. So from this, you end up with this. What does that do? That does things like if you started with triolium at 31%, you decrease the triolium, obviously, because you're creating intermediate triglycerides. You create more of the intermediate species, no, from 2 to 32, for example. SOS, which was not there at all before, you go from almost nothing to now 20%. You're creating the intermediate triglycerides, right? And the tristerin, of course, get plummets because you get rid of the tristerin and the triolin, and you make some of the intermediate ones. Stands to reason. <clears throat> look what it does to the SFC temperature profile, the functionality. This flat line, let's look at 40% fully hydrogenated stock in oil. This is the functionality of your uninterstereified, non-interstereified mixture. It's flat, 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 and it only melts when it gets to 50 or 60 degrees Celsius. That's very far away from physiological temperature, has no functionality. Look at the drastic effect on the SFC temperature profile when you interstereify it. Now you've created something that starts up here and has some sort of curve around the 30, 40 degree uh, range. Now you can blend it. Remember we talked about blending. You can have 30%, 20%, 10% of the hard stock in the oil. And notice how you can affect the, the absolute value of the SFC. This one here looks pretty nice. Again, flat and non-functional. You intersterify it and you have something functional. So without that, we could not use those hard stocks. And we could not really use mixtures of palm sterin and, and high oleic oils because they would just be too waxy, too unyielding, too non-functional. As, as an added thing to this, uh, we have the fact that you, if you interstereify a fat, bear with me, this is a polarized light micrograph of big spherulites of, uh, of the non-interstereified mixture between the two, the fully hydrogenated stock, and after, and the high oleic oil, after interstereification, either one of them, you destroy this mesoscale structure, which are large, let's say, 20 to 30 micrometer crystal spherulites, and you create this ocean of little, little crystals, which is good. And beyond, besides, you've gone from a beta to a beta prime, a mixture of beta, predominantly beta prime, with just a little bit of beta. So not only have you decreased crystal size, which is good for functionality. Um, next time you're like making a cake and you're creaming sugar with fat, and it all mixes together and makes little air bubbles, and then you'll appreciate small crystals. You want that for that functionality. <clears throat> so you've induced the formation of the beta prime and you decrease crystal size. Again, without intersterification, that would not be possible. Now, another application, uh, and we have, we're lucky to have Dr. Ako here, structured lipids. Uh, structured lipids are, so we can uh, change functionality, but we can also make valuable components. Another example of intersterification. Now, what are structured lipids? I would like to define it like this. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I would like to say that structured lipids are triisoglycerates for which some of the naturally occurring long-chain fatty acids in positions 1 and 3 have been replaced either by medium-chain fatty acids, like acrylic or capric, long-chain omega-3 fatty acids, let's say the valuable DHAs, EPA, DPAs, or <coughs> long-chain omega-6 fatty acids, like <coughs> sorry, arachidonic acid, or other foreign fatty acids. What about these MCTs now? Uh, the medium chain fatty acids are easily hydrolyzed. They're directly metabolized for energy than, uh, that rather than accumulated as depot fat. Um, they're a st uh, concentrated and readily available source of energy and maybe have a reduced tendency to promote obesity. This is where you guys got to keep me in check here. And they're useful as supplements with people with chronic health conditions. They cannot eat enough. They're losing weight. They need energy. Hey, give them MCTs or they cannot digest lipids very well. Um, they have liver disease or maybe cardiovascular artery disease. And so they're valuable components in infant formulas, in beverages, snack bars, confectionery products, and supplements for athletes who want a lot of energy in a single take. Now we can have uh, from these structured lipids, uh, the human milk fat substitute, 
oil enrichment with essential or long chain omega-3 fatty acids or the MCTs that I was talking to you about. Let's talk quickly about milk fat, uh, human milk fat. Two things about human milk fat is the fact that palmitic and myristic acids are enriched at positions SN2. So if you take mother's milk, they have most of the palmitic and myristic acids at position most, but a very high proportion of the, of the, of the saturated, long chain saturates 14 and 16 at position SN2. So if we wanted to design a milk fat substitute, uh, we have to take that into consideration. 70% of the palmitic acid is esterified to the SN2 position, with while palmitic acid in vegetable oils is the opposite. It's at positions one and three. Now, if if you feed somebody this, the, the pancreatic lipase or maybe the gastric lipase, a one three specific lipase will split off the palmitic acid from positions one and three. This will combine with calcium in your GI tract and form calcium soaps. Now, if, if they're not a position as in 1 and 3 and 2, they remain as the monoglyceride, which then can get absorbed directly. So you, ha are not, you have not lost that palmitic acid as a calcium soap. And calcium soap uh, of these fatty acids can contribute to uh, comparatively harder stools in babies and uh, calcium and palmitic acid losses. So considering that position of distribution is extremely important. So what we want to do is, is produce a triglyceride with a, a palmitic acid at position number two and maybe an oleic acid at positions one and three. Um, and so you can do an acidolysis or add um, oleic acid to an animal fat like lard um, in order to be able to, with a 1,3 specific lipase, to create this intermediate triglyceride. Now, if you would like to enhance the nutritional value of the food, of the, of the milk fat, you can also add arachidonic acid or DHA to something like lard or tripalmatin that has a palmitic acid at position number two, incorporated it by enzymatic intersterification in the form of acidolysis, and now have a triglyceride that has arachidonic acid at positions one and three or DHA at positions one and three. So here's the example, the major triglyceride in lard, 18, 16, 18, and you can add some... Um, some DHA or arachidonic acid, and now you start incorporating them at positions one and three using an enzymatic lipase in order to make um, a nutritionally enhanced fat for infants. Another product out there is uh, oil containing medium and long chain fatty acids uh, used by transesterification of canola oil and some MCT, which are usually synthetic products and has been in the market since uh, 2003, and it's a faux shoe oil. And in this particular oil has about 35% of long, long, medium, or long, medium, long. As you can see, they have intersterified canola oil with an MCT, creating this intermediate oil, which is used as uh, to provide immediate delivery of the medium chain fatty acids and a slower, more controlled release of the long chain fatty acids, again, by intersterification. In my slides, you can see there's a series of these products of MLCT products from Caprini, Captex, NeoV. So a lot of industrial products out there used for candy bars, for pharmaceuticals, cosmetic, all of them have been manufactured using the intersterification technology. And nutritional beverages, we discussed this with uh, the MCTs, have providing you rapid energy. The last example uh, that I have is cocoa butter equivalents. Uh, cocoa butter is obtained from the mature bean of Theobroma cacao. It contains mainly three triglycerides, SOS, POS, POP, with a sharp melting point around 30 to 32 degrees. It's a very highly valued product. Uh, all the way from the early 80s in a Unilever patents, you can take a palm oil mid-fraction and inter as a do carry out an acidolysis reaction with steric or palmitic acid and now create, or you don't need to use palm oil mid-fraction, you can use any vegetable oil, and as long as you can incorporate 18 or 16, you can make a triglyceride mixture that looks very much the same as cocoa butter. So cocoa butter equivalents can be made by doing acidolysis and intersterification between uh, a, a regular vegetable oil and uh, 18 or 16. And the last thing I found in the literature was some very interesting structure phenolic lipids. 
Uh, so the idea here is to take a, a polyphenolic acid or a phenolic acid and in, an ester 5 onto a triglyceride molecule, which is a type of an acidolysis reaction. And imagine having a big molecule, phenolic molecule, attached to a lipid. And supposedly they have great stability in hydrophobic media, and, um, and then it's more easily available. So here we have this uh, ferulic acid-based structure lipids, enzymatic interstratification of soy oil and ethyl ferulate lead to the production of phenol monoacylglycerols and phenol diacylglycerol compounds. And here are some of the structures. You have soybean oil and it's ethyl ferulate, and in the end you end up with something that looks like a monoglyceride with a ferulic acid attached to it very interesting to even have the diglyceride version of this containing your own antioxidant. Again, this technology was done by a uh, lipase catalyzed um, acidolysis reaction. So in conclusion, chemical and enzymatic interstratification have different applications in the food industry from formulation of shortenings and margarines to synthesis of all these structured lipids, the sky's the limit, for specific medical and nutritional applications. And I believe that these lipase catalyzed intercertification reactions for the synthesis of functional lipids or to affect functionality will remain an area of interest and use for many years to come.